Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'm John Duke. I'm a NOFA board member. Uh, today, we're all very excited. Um, we've got uh, Monique Bosch for Healthy Soils and Healthy Food. Um, this is going to be a fun little dive into the microscope and see what's um, really creating the healthy food um, that we're all trying to get. Um, with me today is Sharon. Sharon's a longtime uh, NOFA uh, uh, member, active NOFA uh, person. Today she's volunteering and help, helping me out um, with this whole piece that I really don't know what I'm doing. But um, so before we uh, before we jump in, we just want to uh, NOFA Mass. <clears throat> um, aims to make our racial equality statement a living document. Uh, so we are all recognizing um, the lands that were previously occupied by indigenous peoples. Um, so we acknowledge that we are all on land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment and find your location on the map and honor those whose land we now occupy. We I want to recognize our sponsors. Without uh, them, we really couldn't have pulled this off. Uh, so definitely take a, to take a moment to, to, to recognize our sponsors. We do have in the uh, uh, workshop, uh, the conference brochure, there are some uh, coupons. Um, and definitely uh, support these folks that are supporting us to bring you all this fine content. So with that, I will Welcome you all, welcome Monique, and pass it over to her. All right, thanks John. Monique, you're up. <laughs> Hi there, hello everybody. Uh, okay, let's, let's do this. I'm going to, uh, we have a lot of short videos to look at. I have a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm just gonna jump right in. Uh, just a little background. Um, I've done, I've been doing, working with farms and actually have designed, built, started uh, about 40 school and community gardens and farms with my nonprofit partner, Dan Levinson, um, including one which I'll, I'll feature in the Berkshires, um, April Hill Farm in uh, South Egremont. And uh, as I was developing these, these gardens, I became more and more interested in the soil. And so I'm gonna talk about that and talk about composting to a large extent. The audience for this would be anybody <laughs> because there's going to be an introduction to thermophilic static pile and worm composting, which hopefully can be applied and expanded on at a farm level. Uh, also, we're going to talk about uh, compost tea brewing and how to do that. And of course, microscopy. I did bring my microscope with me and we can actually look at it in real time if we have time at the end. But uh, I, I think I'm, I'm gonna try to present as much as I can. Um, and we'll, uh, I know I'm coming back at four o'clock with my microscope um, in a QA. and a uh, And if you have specific questions, we can look at, at that then if we run out of time during this talk. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen and I will start with the PowerPoint presentation. So you should be seeing healthy soil, healthy you. Everyone got that? Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, so it really, for me, the, the, the deeper I got with the, the, the microbes and, and, and looking at the life in the soil, the more I realized the relationship between the microbes and growing healthy food. Um, so I love this quote from Vandana Shiva, who talks about um, nature's economy, the currency is not money, it is life. And in this case, I would say life in the soil. She has this other wonderful quote saying that regenerative agriculture, which I'm gonna talk about, answers the soil crisis, the food crisis, the health crisis, the climate crisis, and the crisis of democracy. So that's a quote actually from Kiss the Ground, which I'll talk about again. Um, so basically soil health and nutrition, it shows that there is uh, with the vitamins and minerals in your food, 
um, there, there's a big discrepancy. And what they're finding is it really does depend on where and how your food is grown and harvested. So what we're, we're, we're seeing is this, this shocking decline in nutrients in our food, um, specifically over the last 50 years. So a lot of articles that, that talk about that. And you can see here some of the, some of the things that they've been finding in terms of the, the, the nutrients that we need that are no longer in the food that we're eating. And the interesting thing, which shouldn't surprise anyone here, uh, is the difference between organic and conventional. So uh, just, just look at that and, uh, and be staggered. How many cabbages do I have to eat of conventional cabbages to get the same nutrients? Which is a wonderful argument for buying and growing your own organic food. So remember back in 2015, the United Nations declared it the International Year of the Soils. Kind of freaked me out when they talked about the fact that there were 60 years of farming left because of the degradation of the soil, which continues. The good news is there are ways to rebuild that soil. And one of the main ways, which I'm going to go on at, at length is composting. So this is an excellent book, Secrets of Fertile Soil. And from a grower's perspective, it correlates for the ability of the plant to get its nutrients met. And so that's what we wanna look at with fertile soils. So when we talk about soil health, it really is the continuing capacity of the soil to function as a vital, and I'll stress the word living ecosystem that sustains the plants, animals, and of course us. So uh, this is from the NRDC talking about the difference between living and dead soil, basically dead soil. Whenever you see bare soil, you can assume that it's dead. Um, it causes erosion. Um, you need increased chemicals to try to feed those plants. Of course, most of those chemicals because there's no, nothing to hold the, the, the whatever nutrients they're trying to give the plant in the soil, they get leached out. And there's actually staggering statistics that 50% of the chemical nitrogen and 70% of the phosphorus that are put on conventional farms is leached into our groundwater. Frightening statistic. Um, and of course, the, the inability to fight insects and, and weeds. Uh, living soil, you can tell right away if you have earthworms, um, that is one of the, uh, the, the hierarchies of life in the soil. Um, you'll have residue uh, from previous crops. Um, you'll have microorganisms and of course, cover crops. Um, so the soil being covered as much as possible. This is one of my favorite handouts that I got from uh, NOFA Mass, I guess about three or four years ago, the Carbon Sequestering Guide. It really is an excellent guide um, for, for um, all things dealing with healthy soil. And here's a wonderful quote from that. Whatever takes place each day in the world beneath our feet has wide ranging influence on some of the great issues of our time, pollution, nutrition and health, global warming and the preservation of bio biodiversity, which I'm sure we all agree. And that is available at, um, as a PDF. So um, just so you know, you will have access to, to these slides. I'll put them at, on a PDF in the, in the, I guess we're calling it the library. And so if you wanna refer back to any of this, you can. So any links to, to books or, or uh, publications. So when we want to build up our soil and sequester the carbon, obviously you wanna minimize the chemical, physical and biological stressors. Chemical, it's you know, artificial pesticides and fertilizers. It actively destroys soil life. And um, in fact, one of the quotes from Zach Bush uh, was one application of chemical fertilizer will kill half the life in the soil. The chemicals also will destabilize and degrade the soil structure. And we have an example of that. Uh, here's another quote from Zach Bush. Rototilling is equally damaging to the soil as spraying chemicals. So the no-till argument, which we'll talk about a bit more. Um, and then, so how do you build up this soil and sequester carbon? you basically move away from a monoculture and do a polyculture where you're using multiple crops in the same space 
and try to keep, of course, the soil covered over time with an intercropping of different, different plants and succession cropping. So you have one plant growing after another in the same spot. Um, you want to keep living roots in the soil year round or as long as possible. And you can do this with uh, perennial plants, ground covers, cover crops, and intercropping, which I just talked about. Um, and then keep the soil covered as much as possible. So whenever you're seeing bare soil, you know that carbon and water are, are being absorbed into the atmosphere. And what we actually want is for the CO2 and the water to stay in the soil. And that's what we're talking about when we say regenerative soil. So maintaining living cover of diverse plants as much of the year as possible. So I talked about Kiss the Ground. This is the book. And then there was a movie and um, there's, a, there's a couple of great quotes from the book. Uh, so if you, if you can get access to the book there, it really is a, a wonderful resource for you. Bionutrient Food Association, they're really working hard at uh, showing us and moving the needle in terms of growing nutrient dense food and the role that the minerals that you need are in the soil and life in the soil plays on growing nutrient dense food. And again, that harmony with nature. Uh, the more you're in harmony with nature, the more successful we can at be at growing food. All right, and this is when I do the hands over the head, I am a plant. And basically, this is the, the concept that we're learning more about, is in nature, the plant will take in the, in the sun and it's, it's, it's actually producing sugars through that photosynthesis. And then what we're learning is up to 70% of the exudates that it takes in, it goes out to the root, through the roots to feed the beneficial microorganisms, namely bacteria and fungi that should be in the soil. I like this, this slide showing the, the cross section, which we'll be looking at uh, close up under the microscope. So these microbes use that sugar to reproduce and access minerals out of the soil and feed those back to the plant. So that's that symbiotic relationship where the plant takes in the, in, in the, the photosynthesis and converts it to, and a, and a wonderful quote, this is a, a, another PDF that's available online from Dr. Elaine Ingham. Um, she talks about cakes and cookies. So this graphic sticks in my head uh, where she puts the cakes and cookies and sugar into the soil and in, re in return has that symbiotic relationship. It protecting the root system from plants and diseases, enhances the nutrient cycling and builds structure to allow roots to grow. And John and I were, were, were talking earlier about the fact that we both studied under Dr. Ng. And in fact, she has a, that, um, that course available. So it, it really very much, and you can tell, changed my life. I guess that was like six years ago. And um, I if you have an opportunity to learn from her in any capacity, I would recommend it. Um, so here's our first nematode. Uh, microbiologists estimate there are as many as 1.5 million species of soil fungi and 3 million species of soil bacteria. When you're looking at conventional agriculture, agricultural soils, we're not seeing more than say 5,000. So a huge difference in the life of the soil. Um, if anyone knows Gay Brown, he has this wonderful quote, the soil beneath us is alive. There are more organisms in a teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on earth. So we're gonna take a look at this um, and, and D delve into all of these different trophic levels that are in our soils. So for example, bacteria, the smallest ones, bacteria and fungi, sort of what they look like under the microscope. This is uh, 400 times magnification. And uh, that's another beautiful fungal hyphae. You can see all of these coppery colored bits and I'll refer to them over and over again. Those are aggregates. So they are made up of bacteria, which are sticky, plus the glues that, that, um, that are part of the exudates from the plant form these aggregates, which creates the soil structure. The other thing we're going to talk about is a finding a balance between bacteria and fungi. 
So you disturb the soil, immediately your soil is bacterial dominant. And so you're selecting for weeds. If you go into an old growth forest, you're going to find that it's fungal dominant. So there you're selecting for old growth forest. What we want to grow is right here in the middle, the vegetables, where we're really moving into a, a balance between bacteria and fungi. So for example, brassicas, they can handle more bacterial um, soils, but as you move towards a woodland edge, plants like strawberries, blueberries, those sorts of things, they need more fungal in the soil. So let's take a look at some of the life. You can see this is 100 times magnification. That is a flagellate, one of the smaller predators that we find in our soils. Okay, now we wanna to move to the next one. All right, um, that is a testate amoeba there and we'll be seeing more of those. That's a testate around an actual amoeba. And here are some images at different magnifications of a nematode. And that's looking, that's a bacterial feeding nematode, 400 times magnification. And if we want to see those moving, uh, you can see this is 100 times magnification. And uh, so he's going around these aggregates and, and eating the bacteria, which is creating the nutrient cycling to feed the plants. And these are some nice pieces of fungal hyphae here as well. Uh, that now we're looking at 400 times magnification. You can see the, the, the bacteria that he's already consumed as he's chowing down on this particular aggregate. I love these guys. This is a microarthropod. And unfortunately this guy is stuck under the slip cover, but uh, he almost looks prehistoric to me. We're zoomed in a hundred times. So he is microscopic but he's one of the larger in the trophic levels that we would find in our soil under the microscope. And then of course, I'll have to explain why uh, when I see these guys, I can't just wipe it on a, ta on a cloth. I need to try to get the guy back in <laughs> or on one of my plants so he can continue his, his uh, good work there. Okay, so here is another microarthropod moving around. I think they are the, just one of the coolest things. Um, and then you can talk about aerobic versus anaerobic. When you start seeing these types of amoeba, this is a ciliate, and you can tell by the cilia or the hairs, you know you're starting to go anaerobic, which means there's less oxygen. And that is particularly important when you're doing things, and we'll get into detail, things like compost teas. And you can tell these guys are always zooming around. They're really fun to try to watch and follow, uh, but it does indicate that you have anaerobic conditions. And so uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little more. Um, this was actually when I was up visiting Dr. Ingham. Um, one person sent this sample in of some compost tea they were very proud of. You can see the ciliates running around and um, not much left in terms of bacteria. Um, I, I put this in here because I think it's actually quite beautiful. This is a type of ciliate in some compost tea, but the intricacies were zoomed in 200 times and you can see the, the, the incredible um, detail of that organism. Oh, come on, we want to go to the next slide. Oh, there you are. Um, so he fell off his strand. I don't know why it didn't play the video there, but then we found him. This is 400 times magnification stuck between a rock and a hard place <laughs> a little later in the, in the video. So I just found that was very cool. Um, here's another indication of anaerobic conditions when you start seeing insect larvae or um, rotifers moving around. Very efficient uh, decomposers, but it does indicate that, that you have anaerobic conditions. Um, here's another example of, of a rotifer. All right, and so here you can, this is just looking at some worm casting, actually, that was a, a nematode. See if you can spot the nematodes and the microarthropods in this particular sample. So um, yeah, they're bumbling around. I'll, I might have to point them out. There's a, there's a nematode, microarthropod, microarthropod. So teeming with life. Huh? Oh. I hope it's a worm. 
I guess it's the audio is on this part. That, but it's probably a worm. Compare that to these nematodes. That's a pot worm, baby pot worms. Yeah, really good. So, but I, I don't see the yellow uh, tail. And I don't see the thing in the center. Oh, it's the northwest. So Could somebody um, on, uh, mute yourself. We're hearing your background noise. I think that that might have been the, the, the background noise on the <laughs> video. I, I guess I didn't mute that part. So anyway, that that's a pot worm, which is you wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye. But uh, I often will bring my microscope to different conferences and have everybody just look under it. So about that. Okay, so let's pass, move on. Oh, it's not. There we go. All right. So that's a little introduction to some of the microbes we're going to find. Um, so basically, soil biology is key to building soil carbon and land health because it makes the nutrients of plant available, as I talked about. Um, it captures the atmospheric nitrogen and fixes it in the soil. Um, and you'll see examples of how it supports immunity. Um, it holds those nutrients in the soil. And then, as I mentioned, the plant root exudates um, give the carbon-rich glues that help build that soil structure and, and create those aggregates. And of course, the, the, you can see how efficient they are at decomposing. So they, they actually speed and increase the quality of the composting process. So here's a, a, another um, publication that you can get online from Dr. Ingham, where she says that the only way to get things back in balance is to introduce the full spectrum of this beneficial biology through properly made compost, worm castings, and compost teas. So that would bring us to compost. Um, and so basically um, you can, by adding compost and mulches, um, you are adding the organic matter back to the soil. And also with the compost teas, inoculating with um, beneficial microbes. Another way to do it is, as we talked about, developing a thriving and diverse plant community and um, compo combating pass pests naturally. So having a habitat for natural predators, rotating crops, making sure there's airflow and drainage to avoid areas that, that could be um, anaerobic. And companion planting. Okay, I just love that picture of the carrots. I had to include it. That's a great book for if you are into companion planting. And here's examples of, of companion planting on a, at a home garden scale. And of course, crop rotation. I don't have time to talk about all of these because I'm gonna geek out some more on microscopy, uh, but they're definitely all really important aspects to mm -hmm. soil health. Um, and composting, producing quality compost of my hero, Elliot Coleman, growing food year round in Maine. Um, it, he agrees that it's the most important job on the organic farm. And lots of benefits. Um, before I get carried away with benefits, how are we doing for, for time? I should, let me get my phone so I can keep it. You're keep doing fine. 11.30, okay. According to my, because I have a lot of things to share with you, um, I'm going to go a little bit faster through some of these. Again, you can read these particular slides at a later time. Um, but the, the, the whole um, idea about composting is combining these four elements, green materials, brown materials, and not to be forgotten, air and water. And when we talk about uh, any type of composting, you really want to have a balance between carbon and nitrogen. You want to have, and what we talk about the sweet spot is around 25 to one carbon to one nitrogen. And if you take a look here at, if you wanted to have, for example, a high carbon, you would, okay, wood chips 400 to one, you can see how different you would think wood ash would be very high carbon, but it's not, it's really high nitrogen or in comparison. So you can see the difference here with the high carbon versus the high nitrogen. I was shocked to find that coffee grounds were only 20 to one, 20 carbon to nitrogen. And this is important when you're adding elements to your compost that you try to balance. So you're not just adding food waste 
or coffee grounds or wood chips because, well, as I explain in this next slide, if it is too high carbon, the, car the decomposition is really gonna slow down or not happen at all. Well, it will happen eventually, but if, for example, wood chips will take the nitrogen out of the soil in order to break down because it's, it is lacking nitrogen. Whereas if it's too high, high nitrogen, so you're just using, using food waste, for example, you're gonna end up with a stinky pile, which would be, as I talked about, anaerobic. So then you're gonna be introducing all of those anaerobic microbes, which you don't wanna do. So let's go into composting methods. Um, so we're, we're gonna cover these three, thermophilic, static pile, and of course, true to my heart, worm composting. Uh, the thermophilic, of course, um, what, what I love about it is you can put anything into that because as long as you follow the protocol and the protocol is maintaining a temperature of 131 degrees for 15 days, rotating that pile five times. That is the standard to do thermophilic compost properly. Doing that at a home scale tends to be um, difficult, but it does, when you do do that, you will kill any weed seeds and pathogens. So it does allow you to put in any type of, of input. But as you'll find out, it's labor intensive. Uh, the heat can kill off the, the microbes. Uh, it's hard to get those ratios and high temperatures can lead to nitrogen and carbon loss. So here we're back at Dr. Ingham's farm in, in California, and we did the 20 bucket method. Only two of those buckets are high nitrogen. In this case, we used manure from a field near or a farm nearby. Six of those buckets she called green, I would consider them brown uh, to some extent where you're talking about uh, hedge trimmings, weeds, green leaves, and 12 of those buckets are high, high carbon, e wood chips, straw, cardboard, newspaper. And so what we did, uh, water being crucial to thermophilic, uh, we soaked everything for a day, and then we just added all of these elements into this, I don't know if you can see these, this mesh here. And so um, you can see she's got the hose, every layer we put in, she was, she was watering. And that's a completed home style thermophilic compost. And then you start recording the temperatures as I talked about. Um, and then you can see it at, at 131 degrees, it will get rid of the pathogens in the soil. At 145 degrees, it will get destroy any, any weed seeds. So you need to take readings on, on, a, on a day, well, several times a day actually to, to make sure it doesn't overheat. And uh, you wanna make sure that the moisture is correct, that it doesn't have a foul smell. And then you turn the pile, as I mentioned, five times in 15 days. And so you take the inside of the pile and that'll be the outside of the pile. And uh, this explains, and as you're doing it, you're adding water back into the pile. And then when you're finished with that, you'll spread it and let it um, mature for six months with um, up to six months, or I should say, yeah, six months is probably about right. So here are the stages for thermophilic compost. So here we are at the Reservoir Community Farm in Bridgeport. Um, this is a 1.7 acre um, urban farm, organic farm that we, we, we built um, from an abandoned strip mall. Um, and in this case, we're doing the thermophilic testing here and we're using the spent hops, which unbeknownst to me, had a nitrogen ratio of 12 to one, high, high nitrogen. So we came back the, the next day and here are the interns <laughs> volunteering until they came close to the pile and went, this really smells bad. Okay, it's time to turn the pile. I know it's only been a day, but let's turn it. So we did and uh, yeah, it was not a pretty sight. Labor intensive, very stinky. And so the next day, it was a Sunday morning, I woke up and said, gee, you know, that heated up pretty quick. I better go check. So I went, took my three foot thermometer, stuck it into the pile. It was 178 degrees. This thing was ready to blow. So I took it apart. Of course, all the steam is, is taking off and the people in, that are living right behind there slamming their windows because the smell was putrid. And so basically I was heating, I was heating off, off gassing all the nitrates, which is the last thing you wanna do, thanks to Steve Solomon. 
in his Intelligent Gardener book, reminding me. So then we moved on, didn't we, to static compost piles, uh, which is much easier to control and, and suitable for a home environment. Um, and it's a, it's a different ratio. It's 50 green to 50 woody. And I tend to do it as what I call a lasagna method, where you might add greens from your, from your kitchen scraps uh, and then soil or leaves, make sure you water it in. And then you keep layering it like that on top of each other. So this is uh, the worm bin that I have. And I always say, I, you know, I, I put all of this elements here and then out comes the black gold underneath. Uh, which I use to top dress uh, garden beds. Um, so let's move on. I found in all of these cases, the worm composting to be the most relevant in terms of being able to create um, a, a real diverse um, system of uh, all of those trophic levels of microbes. And it, it's also much quicker. So it's basically using worms to recycle the food scraps. And so, a quick soil test when you're looking at, at worm castings. Um, you can see these, some of these are off the charts in terms of the nutrients available in worm castings. Um, also this incredible cation exchange and the organic matter that exists in worm castings. Um, I'd like to show this slide because these are actually worm bins in a prison in New Zealand where they've gone large scale uh, worm composting. And these are, are some of the, we, we have a, a company called Wiggle Room um, and uh, these are the systems that we're using now in our, um, to create the worm composting. We actually went with a, a delegation from uh, the Schumacher Center for New Economics to Cuba. Uh, that was about five years ago. And we visited 12 farms, every single farm, their main source of nutrition for their plants was worm compost. And so we, we um, that was an eye opener to me, but they didn't have access to chemicals. And of course the food was delicious and healthy and everybody looked pretty healthy there. Um, what to feed your worms. And I'm gonna go through this really quickly because some of you might not wanna do worm composting and you can read about this later. Um, yummy, yucky, what to put into your worm bin. Um, we actually ended up writing the regs to be able to um, make um, organic certified worm castings. So uh, those regs are also available and I'll put that as a PDF um, if you want to do certified organic worm castings. Um, just the difference that I found, um, or actually these are, are known statistics between worm castings and thermophilic compost. Um, so let's take a look at a, a video here, worm composting on the farm. We're gonna to go to the Hickory's farm now, and we're going to um, look at the, the worm composting bin in what we're calling the worm shed at the Hickory's organic farm in Ridgefield. And here's Dina Brewster, the farmer, and she is, she is also, by the way, the executive director of CT NOFA. Talk about things that are central to our farming operation and soil health at our farm. One of the areas our farm that are that is central to biological diversity is this little worm bin. It's a worm farm that was brought to us by another woman-owned business called Wiggle Room out of Bridgeport. And they build these small worm farms or worm bins. Um, and if you, if I can maybe bring this in a little closer, you can see that in this bin are billions of worms hard at work um, and their guts are basically creating all of the, or amplifying the soil bacteria and fungi that will eventually go to work in our fields. That soil biology for us as organic farmers is central to how we create health in crops and uh, nutrition and food. So the healthier our soils are, we know the healthier our food will be for us. Um, and these worms, by creating castings, um, are used, we then um, actually use the castings uh, from this worm bin to create a compost tea, or even the castings can be added directly to crops as we sow them in the field. And what that does is give all of our crops and all of our soil um, an instant recharge, a biological recharge, um, so that it has the strength to carry out exactly what we're asking of it. 
Um, this uh, came to our farm about two years ago, and so it's been part of my uh, thinking in terms of the overall resilience of our farm. We have not yet been able to move away from tillage production here, so we still do plow fields when we need to. We still do use a rototiller, um, and we recognize that that sets us back in terms of our soil health. Um, and so whenever we take two steps backwards, we know we need to take three steps forward um, and that uh, the work of these worms makes that possible for us um, to constantly be regenerating um, and re-enlivening, literally, uh, the soil that our crops are growing in. Okay, so that explains that. <laughs> and uh, um, did that work for everyone? Just doing a check-in. Everyone can see that and it's playing. All right, I'm going to share my screen again and go back to the PowerPoint. This should be seamless, she said. All right, so let's see if we can go to the next slide. All right, you're now seeing compost tea? Yeah, excellent. Okay, so she, uh, Dina mentioned compost tea and, and basically that's a result of aerobically brewing compost in water adding amendments to produce this highly nutritious food source for your plants. Um, so basically you add amendments, you brew the compost tea for 24 hours, um, and then you can apply it to seeds, foliage, roots of plants, um, anytime during the growing process. Uh, this is Dr. Ingham in her, in her um, where is she here? I don't even know. This is not familiar to me, sorry. Um, she talks about the compost extract versus compost tea. And we're doing more and more research in terms of how you can use extracts versus tea when, um, and, and I'm, I'm actually exploring that a little bit more. Um, but basically when you're using an extract, you're just releasing those microbes and using it immediately on your plants, as opposed to a compost tea where you are actively aerating it, uh, you're, you're having amendments so that those microbes will consume those amendments, multiply by the billions, and then your finished liquid after those 24 hours is teeming with beneficial microbes. Um, so some of the benefits uh, that, that we're finding is of course water retention um, because we, we're, we're, um, we're, we're creating soil structure through introducing these microbes to your soil. Um, and also plants taking up the nutrients and so they become more um, immune and, and stronger. Uh, we're finding that the rooting depth of plants are increased and we're finding that we no longer need the chemical-based um, pesticides, herbicides and fertilizers because it is the, the, the beneficial microbes that are available and are no longer being harmed or killed by these chemical uh, applications. Okay, so now back to another video. Um, so I'm going to stop share. A little bit of how to do compost tea. So screen share again. Okay, are you... All right. <laughs> Let's share the right screen. All right, so that's this one here. I'm going to share it. And I just have to make find that. So bear with me here so I can hit play. Okay. All right, so we're going to make some compost tea. This brew is going to be for Gilbertis. All right, so let's mix our solution. The first thing it calls for is a cup of liquid kelp. So now, liquid kelp uh, actually feeds both the bacteria and, and fungi. A good way to remember the ratio between kelp and fish is one to four. So if that was a cup of kelp, this will be a quarter cup. I should mention fish hydrolysate, uh, not emulsion, fish hydrolysate. So when I use the humic acid, it's really as a little bit of an extra shot. The worm castings themselves have a lot of humic acid in them. And you can tell by how dark it is, cocoa color. 
And this will be good to add to the 50 gallons of water that are bubbling away at Gilberti's. So here are our worm castings. We store them in these 10 gallon totes, 40 pound totes. And the trick here is this. This is breathable plastic. They use this to ship goldfish around the world. So you can see the moisture, it holds in all the moisture, but it allows oxygen exchange. So all the microbes that are in the worm casting stay alive for up to, as, as far as I can tell, up to six months. So I have a bag here. I need, for 50 gallon brew, I'm going to need 10 pounds of castings. So there are my worm castings. Hi, good morning. My name is Joe Gloria. I'm here at Gilberti's Herb Gardens, and we are brewing compost tea, as we do every Saturday. And first thing we're doing is we're putting in our hydrolysate. And that's where the magic begins. We put this in, we let it go a little bit, and then we add, of course, the worm castings to this brew. And tomorrow, voila compost worm tea, which is the best thing for all your plants. Okay? So there you have it. We have our fish hydrolysate, kelp, humic acid, followed by our worm castings in a bag. On Friday, we're going to be brewing all day. Come first thing Saturday morning, you can use the product on all your plants, both vegetables, flowers, house plants, shrubs, anything you want and then the magic begins. Yeah, hi, I'm Emma. I also work at Gilberti's. Um, I'm a big fan of the compost tea because it's a really good way to be in harmony with nature because once you're working with nature instead of against it with all chemical products, then I don't know, it just works out better, you know? So. Okay, so thumbs up for that. Um, so I guess right now, uh, one thing we did have to do in order to um, set up at um, the Hickory's farm is we, and also to be able to brew um, at um, Gilberti's, we had to certify our worm compost tea. So we ended up writing the regs again and we got certified organic compost tea. So those regs are also going to be available to you. So let's talk about what the proper procedure is for compost tea. And I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint again. Okay. All right, so um, basically to, to, to be able to certify it, what we do, you can certainly do worm castings with all sorts of inputs, including manures, which is generally uh, used. In fact, when we went to Cuba, uh, one of the main ingredients for all of their worm castings was um, cow manure. But we want to be able to make a compost tea we can use up to the day of harvest, and we want it to be certified organic. So all of our inputs need to be certified organic and vegetative only. So we actually get our juicer waste from an organic juicer bar. Um, but if you buy organic vegetables or grow your own organic vegetables, you can use the, 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 um, the remnants of that. And then you want to have or, uh, organic amendments um, as well. So uh, these are some that we, we got approved, fish hydrolysate, liquid kelp, there's fish bone meal, alfalfa meal, and of course, humic acid. It used to be, uh, when we first learned this from, from Dr. Ingham, I guess that was six, seven years ago, uh, it, a big um, thing that we would add as an amendment was molasses. But what we found was it was a bacterial food only and it multiplied the bacteria, or give, give bacteria sugar, or me sugar, <laughs> and all bets are off. So they would multiply by the billions, use up all the oxygen, and your compost tea would go anaerobic. So now we no longer add molasses. And what you can do is use it as a foliar spray. Um, it's in a, a form that the plant can immediately take up. Uh, on all using it on all sides of the, the leaves and also as a root trench. Um, there, there's so many stories I could tell you here, um, including this apple tree at Reservoir Community Farm, which was the only tree that we actually ended up spraying every two weeks and we had an amazing uh, amount of apples from this. Uh, so it, it actually gets rid of retritus, rust, we use it as, as powdery mildew control. Um, but 
enough on that. Now we're going to go to uh, the Berkshires and we're going to look at them brewing compost tea up there. So let me grab that video for you. Now I just have to find it. Okay. Now we're going to travel 100 miles north to Egremont, Massachusetts and the Berkshires. This is April Hill, run by Greenagers, a nonprofit working with young people doing green jobs. That's Justin Torico in the field in March, and here we are a few months later. Look at the development and the gardens that have been created, planted, and are now maintained by young people. And what are they using for fertilizer? Compost tea. Here's Mac to tell us more. So right here, we have uh, our small scale compost tea brewer. And we're using this right now to kind of introduce the farm to the idea of brewing compost teas. And it's, it's something that is beginning to gain uh, footholds in the larger agriculture industries, as well as um, has great benefits for small home gardeners as well. You can take this from this scale all the way up to large agriculture with huge 100 to 800 gallon brewers and the concept stays the same. All right, it's now 24 hours after brew. And in the seven gallon brewer, we can see the bag is, uh, has castings in it still, although it feels rather gritty. All of the nice texture of the worm castings uh, are gone. That now is in the liquid. The microbes have been feeding off of the amendments and multiplying by, by the billions. All right, so we brought it outside and raised it up so it'll be easy to fill up this bucket. Edward, can you just lift up the what's inside there? So you can see that that is 400 micron. They actually use it as a paint strainer and it fits perfectly on a five gallon bucket and is exactly the right mesh size, 400 microns, to allow microbes to go through but hold any sediment so it doesn't clog your sprayer or whatever you're using. All right, shall we fill up the bucket? Yep. So you can see the sediment collecting in the paint strainer while I fill the bucket. Edward is now watering in the seedlings that were transplanted last week. These are some beautiful tomatoes. And in fact, these particular tomatoes, if we look a week earlier, Ada is taking the transplants and submerging them in compost tea from that week's brew and potting them up. And again, applying those nutrients right around the roots of the transplanted seedlings. Here we have Justin Torico. He is watering in the seedlings that are getting ready to go into the field. And again, adding those nutrients and beneficial microbes right to these small seedlings so that that symbiotic relationship between the plant roots and the microbes can start early on. This is a great way to inoculate the soil and really give those seedlings an excellent start. All right, the compost tea is, uh, it, it's nice to use it because, you know, anything that seems like, wow, it's you know, stagnated in growth, it's looking like it's starting, starting to turn the wrong direction, get some compost tea, come back two days later, it's looking great. <laughs> you know, I guess, I love things like that. You know, there is no, like, uh, magic potion, but certainly there are ones that help. <laughs> okay, thank you, Justin. So back to our, we're just jumping around here, but so far so good, right? We're gonna go back to our PowerPoint and look at some research and trials that we've been doing. Uh, so here's a quick example of compost tea. I just had some uh, at the farm. This is again at the Reservoir Community Farm in Bridgeport. And I said, well, let's just spray one, one bed and not the other. And uh, we, of course we want to let the purslane grow in the center. So th those are just weeds that we kept, weeds, food. Um, 
but you can see the difference between these peppers and uh, the eggplant in, in five days, they're like double the size, blew our minds. And here are just some, some um, test, I'm always doing test trials, <laughs> but anyway, here's one, we had just adding 10% worm castings um, to one tray versus the other with microgreens. And this was an interesting experiment where the middle tray had four month old castings rather than fresh castings. And the four month old castings did better. Uh, the theory being that the, the microbes um, continue with the decomposition and adding more and more available nutrients as they, they continue to work through the, the finished castings. Um, and here's a, a, a little example where I took um, just soil that had uh, chemical additives um, versus um, just organic soil, seed starter with uh, worm castings. And uh, here we are a few weeks later, you can see that the difference already in color and the taste, texture, size, and of course, you know, kind of chewy, stuck in my teeth. <laughs> this one, crunchy and sweet. Um, and again, look, June 22nd, the difference. So now we're starting to get diseased uh, versus you know, taking over the joint. Uh, so let's see what that looks like under the microscope. So this is that bag soil with chemical fertilizer. 400 times magnification. And um, this is the microscopy uh, of the uh, 400 times magnification as well of the bagged organic soil that has the worm castings. Look at the soil structure there, such a difference. This is a, a set, okay, I did this a few days ago. I was really curious because I, I got this one, I got with um, chemical fertilizer and all these other um, additions in the soil, a bag of that, a bag of just regular organic seed starting mix. And then I added 10% worm castings. It doesn't look like that much difference from this angle, but the taste alone told the difference. You can see the color difference. And this started to get powdery mildew on the cabbage leaves. Um, and then the size and color difference between the three trials. So here you can really see when you take a, a single leaf. And then looking at the, what the, um, the, the root structure looks like. And you can see the natural way that roots are growing uh, when, you, when you have the life in the soil. Again, looking at the soil in terms of uh, what actually is in there, very little life. It included the, the, um, the organic seed starting mix. But then the minute you start adding um, life in the form of worm castings, you can see the aggregate structure and the, the, um, the life that, that exists in, in that sample. Okay, so this is 2019, before I go on and on. All right, I have about half an hour left. Um, we're getting there. So uh, I did a test trial. I took these two 84 foot long beds, um, grew exactly the same thing, did a, a replication three times of, of the same crops. Um, before I started, after I decided which bed was going to be which, um, I did a soil test at, U, at UMass and found, okay, my control had much better quality of uh, nutrients than my, my north bed, which, which was gonna be my worm castings and compost tea side, but so be it. Let's see what kind of results we're gonna get. So here I am adding 10% of the, the worm castings to the, the seed starting mix. And the other thing I did, I added a cup of um, worm castings when I transplanted around the roots of the transplants. And then every three weeks to uh, five applications altogether, I added the worm castings. Now I did add those same um, nutrients in the control and applied it the same way. So without bothering to brew the compost tea, I added those um, organic elements uh, with a foliar spray and as a root drench. So exactly the same, except this had, the, it had been brewed for 24 hours with compost tea. So here, let's just look at the harvest that we, we see. When I took photos of the harvest every time I, I, I took um, produce from those, those beds. You can see the difference from one to the other. So um, the other most interesting thing that I was not expecting is the control had a huge difference in terms of longevity of the produce. So it was 
full of um, disease and, and bruising as opposed to the, um, the worm castings, compost tea size. Look at the color as we go through these of the, of the, the food and also the yield. Um, again, now we're moving on and um, we had a 1.7 time the amount of yield from the worm casting side. And then we expected a frost, it's October 4th now. Um, you can see that was our last harvest. And I got around to making sauce 15 days later, I could not use any of the control um, produce. It had all rotted away while the tomatoes on the worm casting side were beautiful and delicious. <sighs> so that was eye-opening to me and um, would like to replicate that, um, that trial um, this coming season. So let's take a look at soils under the microscope. So now I'm going to go to our last video here. So that is the Monique, soil. if I chime in real quick. Yes. We had one question about, um, before you get into the microscope, um, could you give a recommendation about the type of microscope that you actually would recommend to use this, to do this kind of work? Right, um, I do have it. And I, I wish I had, someone with me here who could put it in the chat. <laughs> but this one, um, you, what I really like is to have one, all right, while we're here, let me stop sharing so I can show you, because I don't, we're already halfway, for, uh, half an hour left. So this particular microscope here, what I like about it the most is that you can plug it in from the viewfinder into your computer. I have a Mac, so I'm actually plugging it in to uh, my, what we call a uh, photo, photo booth on my Mac so that I can record all of my videos and I can share them or rem rem remember them. So that's how I've been recording from my microscope. This is an Omax. And the other thing I like uh, is having numerous uh, zoo, uh, capability of, of different lenses. So everything from 40, I don't go past 400. Unfortunately, they don't make this particular one anymore. The one they have is similar by Omax, but it only go, it does have a 1000 times magnification, which I do, do not use. So it, it's, it's um, I actually prefer the 40, 100, 200 and 400 times mag. Um, but the, the Omax that the, that's now available, I think it's $350, but having this ability to plug it into your computer um, and record the videos of what you're seeing under the microscope, I think is key. Um, so that is the microscope. And maybe we'll have time to, uh, to show you how, how it all works so that you can actually do it yourself. It's not difficult. There's just certain protocol to follow. Um, all right, can I now, now can I show the video? Okay, so we're gonna screen share again. Uh, not the PowerPoint, bear with me. Quick time player. Okay, now I have to find it. Here we are. Okay, it's kind of funny. This is 100 times magnification. It looks like a tail wagging. It is a nematode feeding on this aggregate full of bacteria. This is found in soil in a cold greenhouse, unheated, at the Hickory's Farm, growing this time of year Swiss chard, no-till um, greenhouse. 400 times magnification. Testate amoeba. You can see the density of this soil seeing quite a bit of fungal hyphae in there. And uh, there's a nice piece of fungal hyphae right there. The density is, is really the most impressive. So great soil structure, good for nutrient and water retention. So you can see that I've zoomed in to flagellate 400 times magnification, bumbling around. This is very dense. It's a soil sample from a high tunnel in January from Masaro Community Farm, where they are growing cover crop. And uh, I'm seeing also a lot of bacteria, um, 
oh, there you go. There's a, another piece of fungal hyphae. So lots of diversity, excellent soil structure. Really nice to see. This is 400 times magnification. We're looking at mature compost from New England compost and uh, lots going on. That's a beautiful testate amoeba there. Some wonderful aggregates uh, full of bacteria. And the whole thing has got a lot of bacteria in there and some fungal hyphae. You can see it's very dense, lots of life moving around. We're looking at 200 times magnification. Asawaga Farms, uh, this is it's a lot of fungal hyphae. It's been shaken, so all these are pieces of fungal hyphae. Uh, this is a bed that has ginger in the greenhouse. It's a second year bed. It has not been tilled for two years. Um, compost added in the spring. And uh, only ginger going on. Tomatoes last year. 400 times magnification. This is soil from Bob Seabacher's most beautiful garden underneath some perennials. You can see that is the flagellate bubbling around in the center of the frame. Good aggregate structure. There are some fungal hyphae in here, which is nice to see. Good variety of bacteria. Looks like a testate amoeba there. Oh, and there's another beautiful piece of fungal hyphae. Really looks great. Now, if I zoom out all the way, that's 400. This is 40 times magnification. And you can see that it is consistent throughout. 400 times magnification. This is Shirley's Dahlia 2 garden. As you can see, it, it's a lot more sparse in here. So there's bacteria. That was one piece of fungal hyphae, but not a lot of soil structure or organic matter. We're now uh, visiting a conventional farm. We're looking at a no-till field on that farm, 100 times magnification. And comparing that to a tilled field, uh, these fields also get chemical applications, including fungicides and Roundup. Here is the hedgerow beside the tilled field. And you can see the density of the aggregates and the soil structure compared to the tilt field right next door. Okay, at that happy note. So to me, that really does show you um, the, the effect of tilling and chemicals um, to the, the structure and the life of the soil. Um, so I think here, let me just check. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've finished my PowerPoint presentation. Um, yeah, and Monique, we, yes. <clears throat> we do have quite a few questions. Okay. Uh, so if you, uh, I, I can answer, I, I've been taking notes from questions in the chat and I think there's a few people, if we have time, might want to chime in themselves. Okay. Um, but going back to some of your earlier uh, shots, you were showing um, Elaine's style of building a compost pile in the wire container. Um, we had one question specifically about, you know, that compared to your typical three bin, more static pile and what are the positives and negatives of those two systems? Well, I guess the, the biggest, if you have things like weed seeds and uh, you want to add everything from your, your garbage, um, you would want to be able to do thermophilic so that you would have kill the pathogens and kill the weed seeds. Uh, so that really for me is the main reason to do thermophilic so that everything can be composted. It, um, the heat also will speed up the comp decomposition where a static pile is pretty, as the word might indicate, static. So it takes longer. Uh, in fact, I will just continue to add elements to the top of my quite small worm bin and they'll you know get smaller and smaller to um, about 80 percent decrease and then um, only in the spring will I have be able to remove the, 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 the compost the finished compost so it's a longer process uh, what I don't necessarily like about the three bin system 
uh, depending on where you live, is um, the rodents and, and attracting um, animals that you might not want, especially if it's close by your garden. Uh, it's like, come on down. Uh, even this often will get broken into and I'll have to re reinforce the, the sides or, or they'll dig underneath to get into the compost. So I would prefer if you are doing static that you have something structured so that rodents and, and other animals uh, can't get into it. Is that? Yeah, I, th I think it's one of those things that there's, there's not really a right way or a wrong way. There are lots of different ways. And sometimes it, it depends on, you know, your, your backyard, your place, what your intentions are. Um, they're all useful. And, um, but one other question about um, cold weather and the worms. Um, one person made the comment that, you know, some of the earlier slides that you were showing were all in, in warmer climates with uh, the, the warm um, bins and so forth. How would somebody in a New England climate um, work with their worm bins on a larger scale when it's not in your basement in a tub? Oh, hi. It's so good you mentioned that because oh, we just moved our worm business from the basement of a climate controlled basement in Bridgeport to a unheated shed in Ridgefield at the Hickory's farm. And so we just insulated it and we're using just a regular um, little, um, what do you call that thing? Uh, like a, a radiator, a plug-in radiator to try to keep the temperature above freezing. So I was there at seven o'clock this morning and it wasn't, so <laughs> I had to increase it. Anyway, so this is the problem with these worms. They do not like to be below 40. What we do, I have an actual, one of those larger bins outdoors here, and I put a heat mat that they use to warm seedlings. And then we have a little control, a thermostat on there. So it only turns on if it goes below 40. So we put the probe at the bottom of, of the castings and that will keep the entire um, bin from freezing. And this is year four of this system outside, it works great. The problem we're having at, um, at the farm, we have these um, the different types of bins where you can't put with drawers that pull in and out. So you can't put um, a, a mat, but we have certainly found that unheated, uh, where we, we heard Dina talking, that is an unheated shed. And we also have one of those um, two by four foot he, um, heat mats sitting on top of the bin, on top of the worms. And then that's what she was lifting up. So that seems to do the trick for the winter. I will interject here too. There are some different species of worms, and some of them are have a larger span of, of temperature that they can uh, they, they can withstand. So it is if you want to get into worm composting, it's a little important to uh, pay attention to what species you're getting. Um, the red wiggler, uh, which is Essena fetida, um, has a fairly broad span of, of temperatures and it can actually handle things quite cold. They can't freeze, but they're certainly pretty durable, um, particularly in New England. And I, I find a lot of it, it's like, as long as you give them the space and um, enough thermal mass to get away from the very cold areas, they're probably going to do fine. Um, um, small scale brewing technique on a budget for the home gardener. A lot of the, the brewing vessels that you showed were obviously larger, um, somewhat commercial. Um, maybe just a quick, how would you do it um, in a five gallon version for a smaller garden, smaller budget, um, smaller system? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have that slide. I have a wonderful slide of um, exactly that in my kitchen, <laughs> brewing away. Uh, and what I ended up doing, especially when I got my microscopy and realized, wow, it goes anaerobic really quick. The problem with anything that is cylindrical is those all the way around the perimeter at the bottom are anaerobic conditions where the water is not recycling. So the reason to use a funnel shape is that there's nowhere for those anaerobic microbes to hide. And so you, that, that was why we ended up you know, going to, to the funnel shape um, brewer. Uh, but certainly in the beginning, um, all I would do is, is brew compost tea in a five gallon bucket. And then we got into a 50 gallon bucket uh, or garbage pail, I should say at the farm. 
uh, in Bridgeport and we brewed in that and we had aquarium bubblers in there and I would put rocks down and have those four hoses all pointing in different directions from each of the bubblers so that trying to get to, that there were no um, anaerobic areas within that cylinder. And we were fairly successful, but part of the regs that we ended up putting to make it certified organic compost tea is you need to check your compost tea once every three or four brews, just to make sure you're not brewing or multiplying the anaerobes. Um, uh, but you also wanna make sure uh, that you, that you um, clean it properly, that you don't have any biofilm. And I, I do give a talk just on compost tea. I could go on for a couple of hours. <laughs> Luckily, um, I'm gonna be cut short here, but uh, what we talk about there is how to clean biofilm. A simpler system is easier to clean. If you have all these hoses coming in and out, uh, of course, you have to clean each one because that's where the biofilm and the anaerobic microbes are gonna hang out. So as clean as possible, the water can't be chlorinated. So you want, if you don't have um, access to fresh water and just tap water, you have to let it, um, what we do is we bubble it for 24 hours so that all the chlorine dissipates. Also the humic acid from your amendments will help to neutralize the chlorine. Um, so those are all things to consider because if you just put uh, these castings in chlorinated water, of course, the microbes will be killed by the chlorine. I, again, I'm going to interject here too because there's a difference between an extract and a tea. So what Monique's talking about is really bringing it to that tea level, which if you're using it as a foliar, that's very important. If you are just doing a soil application, you can literally take some of your really good compost put it in a five gallon bucket, agitate it with your hand and, and apply that slurry um, onto your, your plants as a, as a soil inoculant. Um, and that can be done in a five gallon bucket in a minute. Um, it, when you're brewing, you're really looking to apply these particularly as a foliar. So it, it can be literally that simple, a five gallon bucket, some nice compost, mix it around and go to town. And if that's all you can do, that's gonna be wonderful. <laughs> um, we got probably way too many questions to get through all this, but um, uh, one question, quick question about uh, molasses, because uh, one of the viewers um, has, is obviously familiar with Michael Phillips work. Um, and he apparently does recommend, you know, using molasses as a foliar on his trees um, in conjunction to what you brought up about molasses. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, specifically, if it is trees, I would want to go with a higher fungal. And this is another thing I didn't talk about. Um, so when you're, when you're introducing molasses as an amendment, it really is just feeding the bacteria. Um, and remember I mentioned you want it more fungal, especially as you're going towards trees. So we have um, taken soil that is high fungal and use that as mix that in with the worm compost to get a higher fungal tea for such things as trees. And what we were experimenting up at Greenagers was to, uh, we were planting, we're doing um, the silvopastures where we're planting hundreds of, of fruit and nut trees. And what we're doing is taking soil from around old growth trees, looking at it on the microscope, making sure we have really nice fungal, and then using that to make a tea to inoculate the soil around these new um, saplings. And uh, we're, they're doing all, everybody's doing great. <laughs> so we're, again, this is just preliminary stages, but what we're finding is my recommendation would be if you're doing things like brassicas, yes, you could add some molasses, um, but, and especially if you're using compost as opposed to worm compost, there'll be less bacteria in a compost than, than a compost tea, uh, sorry, than a worm castings. Um, so then you might want to, um, to have more multiplication um, and again, give somebody sugar and they're gonna get that energy pretty quickly as opposed to the healthy vegetable <laughs> inputs uh, or, or the, the, um, the kelp and, and the fish hydrolysate. And one, uh, 
Well, I, well I'm going to keep going, going through all this, but um, uh, somebody also asked about uh, sprayer considerations in the frame of applying these microbes without hurting them. That's key. And Oh, I wish I had the numbers in front of me, but um, what I tend to do with, I have a backpack sprayer that I use and I'll have the droplet size fairly large. So not a, a fine mist or a spray because that's going to apply too much pressure and the whole size will be too small. So more of a droplet size where actual droplets are forming as you're spraying onto the leaves seems to work the best and, and is less harmful. Um, but there are certain regs, uh, is it 300 PSI? Oh my goodness, I don't want to be quoted, but um, I know there are, there are regs to, to how large and, and um, intense the, the spray is. Did you want to yeah, there's, one, there's two considerations here because when you are looking at a pump, especially if it's an electric pump and you're providing a high PSI, the high PSI on the pump is one consideration, but what you really need to think about is the velocity that that spray is actually hitting the leaf. Right. Because if you're trying to spray to the top of a 30 foot tree, you're going to need a 150 PSI pump to achieve that. That in itself isn't going to necessarily hurt the microbes because by the time it gets up to the leaf at 30 feet in the air, that impact isn't that great. So, you know, the consideration uh, in the pump is, is how hard am I splashing this material onto the surface? And you also want to avoid 90 degree bends in your piping, because again, that volume of water is being pushed through a pipe. And if there's a 90 degree turn, those microbes are hitting that angle and getting turned. So you're destroying, you know, that community on the way out. Um, so it's not hard and fast, you know, you, it depends on your application. Um, um, if you're using a hand pump and a diaphragm pump, it's probably going to be fine. Some of the centrifugal pumps might be like a food processor. So you have to be a little careful about that. Um, and ultimately at the end of the day, that's where your microscope comes in because you test your sample going into the pump and you test your sample coming out of the pump and you make sure that you're not losing anybody along the way. Excellent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. What else do we got here? <clears throat> Ten more minutes. Um, oh, this. So, what's your thoughts? Somebody asked about <clears throat> the compost teas <clears throat> and the results that you saw about preserving your crop. Uh, what are your thoughts about why? Why is the compost tea giving you the shelf life? on your crops? Uh, well, I think what you're doing is you're growing from the moment the seed germinates, you have those microbes <clears throat> right around there. So that already um, you're forming that symbiotic relationship. So you're growing a more hardy, resistant plant from the get-go. And so what will happen is as that plant produces the fruit, the uh, there won't be any pests and diseases that are, that are harbaging there. And also the, the skin of that fruit will be stronger and more resilient. So you won't end up getting the, the bruising or the, the, the introduction of, of disease. Does that answer that question? I think so. Um... But I, I was not expecting that result. I thought, okay, maybe we'll get more yield and it'll taste better, but last that much longer and have that much more resilience. I was just shocked. Um, I'm going to throw this one out there. Uh, Jose Whelan had a, quite a few uh, questions about like infrastructure costs. Um, I don't know if he wants to chime in personally and ask the questions because there was quite a few. Uh, Jose, if you're out there and you're still on and you'd like to ask that question to Monique. Sure. I mean, it seems like a lot of the slides we're showing um, are much more for commercial scale or folks who are making money off of agriculture. And I just want to mention when you talked about like how hard a thermal pile is with labor versus the ease of these worm systems, all those worm systems you showed and develop are highly capital intensive, right? They were 
electric motors or electric heating pads. And all that's required for a good thermophilic, organic certified, whatever you want to call it, biodynamic, um, permaculture approved compost pile is some blood, sweat and tears, right? Which unless we're working on a no-till farm 60 hours a week, we all got some extra energy to spare. Um, so go out and turn that pile and it costs you nothing, right? If you, all you got to do is five turnings. I mean, you don't have to go to the gym. You don't have to do your yoga classes. You just, you just maintain the thermophilic. And I feel like you move through that a little bit and move to a space that for a lot of home gardeners, if they don't have the capital resources or, or the ability to have electricity or all these things, they're going to be SOL when it comes to compost and real basic compost is simple it's old it's traditional and it's it's worked uh it's worked for thousands of years um and i guess tied into that is this question about humanure if we're really trying to close the loops we got to stop flushing it uh into a septic system or into a waterway or whatever we do with our poop um and find ways to have it be legal so i don't get arrested by the cops because i'm trying to take care of my own waste. So what's, what's it been like looking at humanure and getting that certified organic? I, I think you're bringing up some wonderful points and, and thank you for, for speaking out that that's really important. And I agree um, where you are and I, you look like you're in a beautiful place. <laughs> and, uh, you, you, and, and you're, you're probably a lot stronger than I am um, doing thermophilic uh, is probably the way you want to go. I've had a, uh, a worm compost bin in my dining room for the past 25 years. Um, it cost me uh, $7.97 to buy a 10 gallon tote. And that's what I used for the first 10 years at least. Um, and that's how I got so excited about being able to take my you know, peelings and whatever else I'm doing and being able to, to, to turn it into this most amazing and have the worms do the work for me. And so I did find for me, the progression to more larger, and again, a, um, a stackable worm bin can cost you a hundred dollars. And then you can have literally uh, a four foot stack of, of worm compost at building up. I mean, I. I could go on and, and describe that particular process. I've tried it, but they died. They're hard to maintain. Oh, don't tell these guys over here. All right, you asked for it. I'm gonna take you over here and introduce you to just a couple of worm bins here. Let's see how this guy's doing. Okay. So this is an inside worm bin. You can see they really like the avocado peel. Uh, they like melons. You can see how happy these guys are. And what's cool about the, can, can everyone see what I'm doing here? So anyway, I have, I have a couple yeah. of, I'm babysitting somebody else's, but anyway, so it, it's, it really is, it's a, it's a, you know, a, a whole way of uh, finding that balance. And just as thermophilic, for me, finding that balance of carbon nitrogen ratio was very difficult and stressful. Uh, where I find letting these worms do the work for me and having control, because they're like right there, um, was allowed me to be successful for the past 30 years. Well, what do you do with it? What do you do with the kitchen scraps that they don't like to eat? You have to have a second so compost. That, yeah, it's my static pile outside. Yeah, I, I like to keep it simple, K-I-S-S. -S. Ooh, that's a good one, okay. Uh, What's the, the final uh, answer? Yeah. I don't wanna know. <laughs> okay, go ahead. There, so I'm just gonna uh, thank you, Monique. We got a couple more minutes and we can kind of keep this open for, for a little longer and people can, uh, can chime in if they want to. Um, Monique, well, your passion. You. Um, at four o'clock, I'll What's be that? Here. At, uh, we can wait till four o'clock. I'm oh. doing Q and A, and I'll do some microscopy at that time. That's great. That's great. Your passion for this is apparent, and the slides that you presented are absolutely beautiful. Um, and what you're doing here is is great. And I want to thank you very much for for sharing all this with uh, with the NOFA membership. 
Um, obviously people, this is an enormous field and we know more about the solar system than we do about the soil underneath our own feet. Um, so if you're interested in this, it's great. And the more we can look at the soil and feel it and smell it and breathe it and hold it, um, the better off we're all gonna be because um, that's where the answers are. And we'll probably never understand it. And there's lots of different ways that we can do this. And there's no one particular right way. Um, you gotta do what's right for you, um, but uh, let's just do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so thank you, Monique. Um, that was great. It was really great. And don't forget guys, bid on because so much of Monique's work came from Elaine Ingham. Um, and the foundation courses are spectacular. We've got them in our auction this year. Uh, it's a wonderful way to spend your winter um, and, and open up a literal wormhole of, of, um, of an experience for you all. So, so take a look at that as well as all of our other great auctions. I did post a couple things in the chat. Um, if you guys wanna save the chat uh, for um, some of the links that I put in there, you can do that by, by clicking on the three little dots in the chat before we close out. You might wanna save that. Um, and uh, Monique, maybe you wanna throw your email address in there uh, so people can get in touch with you directly. Um, and John, don't forget uh, and... the evaluation. I did post the link in there for the evaluations, um, but please definitely, uh, we, we wanna hear your feedback on these and how can we do a better job? Um, did we do a good job? Um, I know I didn't do a good job, but <laughs> um, that's, um, I don't know, Sharon, you got anything else for me? Nope, it's great. I know you posted All that. Right. I just I just wanted to make sure people remembered to do it. Yeah, it's very helpful for us. We need your feedback. We need your feedback all the time because we're we're here for you, and uh, we want to represent you guys. Um, so that's it. I'm gonna open this up. We can probably hang for like maybe five more minutes. I don't know, Monique. You want to have a closing word? Thank you so much. That was awesome. All right. Well, um, if anyone wants to stick around for five minutes with some some uh, earth shattering information. I would love to hear it. Anything to add? I'm gonna say one quick thing because I do know that uh, most of us would be looking at soil and not see anything like what Monique was showing. And unfortunately, most of our soils out there are pretty barren compared mm -hmm. to what Monique, Monique was showing us like the cream of the crop and what life should be. Um, and it's unfortunate and it's another reason why we all need to take this into consideration and try to understand this and work hard to bring these microbes, you know, back to our soil because they're going to save us. <laughs> so Monique, I have a quick question. Um, if they, if in hardware stores and Home Depot and the rest, they can sell chemicals and glyphosate, why can't compost tea be sold there? Uh, well, the problem with compost tea is it has a very short shelf life. Ah. So that's why when we talked to, uh, went to Gilberti's, they brew it every, so it's ready every Saturday. This is now year three. Yep. Um, so people are used to going Saturday morning knowing that's when the compost tea is ready. Got it. Yep. It's hard to train people. <laughs> but okay. yeah, that's that's right. So it's really not possible to do that in terms of getting it into stores where people could just easily, easily be able to get it. No, that's the that's a problem. The short shelf life with it. Um, uh, the worm castings, yes, we sell them in those breathable bags, yep. uh, but not the tea. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. So Monique, here here's a um, question from Jane Hammer. Then I'm going to read observing fungal hyphae under the microscope. If you see fragments as you were showing, can you be confident that there is a thriving population? If the soil is disturbed and on a trajectory toward less fungal dominance, how long would you expect the fungal strand fragments to survive and be viable under the microscope? Oh boy. Um, 
Well, are you wondering about when it's in the soil or just looking at a sample? How long will the sample last? I'm a little confused about that. Jane, are you there? Maybe you Jane. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was more interested to know like how you correlate what you're seeing under the microscope to the trajectory that you would expect in the soil or the compost that you're taking that sample from. Um, if you're seeing the fragments of the fungal hyphae, like. You would have to assume, and again, you wanna be able to release those fragments from your sample so you can look at it under uh, with the liquid. Um, so if you don't shake it, you're, you're not gonna see those fungal strands, but it is an indication. So when we were at Asawaga Farm, we saw all those fragments. We could actually, when you're looking at the soil, you can say, wow, look at their stuff. You can, there's a sense of it, even though it's microscopic, you can, it's a different texture to the soil that says this is fungal. Just like if you go to an old growth forest, that soil is very different than if you go into your um, annual crop bed. So I think you can assume looking under the microscope, if you see the fragments that you have longer strands in that soil. If you see no fragments at all, chances are you don't have fungal. Okay. So some fragments is a sign that, that they're present. Yeah. I guess when I'm thinking about like taking compost that I'm trying to use to add fun, fungi to a, you know, a bed that hasn't had much fungal influence before. And I'm looking at that sample from the compost that I wanna add. If I see fungal strands in that compost, even if it's not like really evident with the texture of the compost itself, I'll know that those things can, those fungi can establish themselves most likely. Uh, or that they're there. It's just showing you what's there. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to interject something yeah. also is that um, I found that if you cut off your plants and leave the roots of your vegetables in the garden over winter, um, from what I've read and, and observed, uh, not only will that feed soil microbes to have those roots there as they decompose, it's also a habitat for uh, the fungal hyphae to be there to be able in the spring to start spreading immediately and not have to be weight to be added through compost. Because you're not disturbing the soil by removing those roots. Right. You cut, you cut the tops and put them in your compost. Perfect. I should have talked about that. Thanks, Sharon. There's so much to talk about. I mean, this just, you know, it's, Shall we it's massive. So. At four <laughs> yeah. How about, how about, yeah, I'll be there at four. Yeah, because we probably do have to shut this down because I think somebody else is going to need this room relatively soon. Um, You're the this is great. Four now. No, this is <laughs> yeah. It'd be so much better if we could do this in person, but uh, this is the best we can do. And someday we will, you know, it'll be great. So thank you, Monique. Thank you, everybody. Really enjoyed it. Everybody come on back and ask her more questions at four. Um, and uh, have a great day. We'll see you around.